coming up on Stu Does America. Our own Sarah Gonzalez is in an all-out battle to the death with millions of teenagers on the internet about Taylor Swift. And she's pissed off about it. We'll get the story. And how do you fight back when being verbally assaulted by some climate change nutcase? Alex Epstein gives us the resources to fight back. If you're currently listening, you can watch as well on YouTube. Just go there and search for Stu. I'll be the first one there. And make sure to like the video to defeat the evil YouTube algorithm robots. If you're watching, you can always listen too on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just subscribe, rate, and review. Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. Plus, you can subscribe at blazetv.com slash Stu. Make sure to use the promo code Stu because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Plus, you'll save 10 bucks. There you can watch or you can listen too. Just close your eyes and the magic will happen. Well, the Democrats have a say. When they go low, they will eventually go lower. And they did that already at the convention. Let's do the Democrats' exploitation of death. I don't expect a lot out of Democrats. Most of them are awful. I go into a night watching the Democratic convention the same way I go into a Taylor Swift album. Sure, there's probably going to be some decent production quality, but there's also going to be the emotional maturity of a 17-year-old, the intellect of a 14-year-old, and everyone there is going to look like a human-cat hybrid. The last one is really more specific to Taylor Swift, but you get the point. It's pretty hard to disappoint me at this point with the Democrats. My expectations are already so low. I'm already expecting a feline lookalike to warble her way through 12 diary entries she wrote in middle school, and I never expect to hear the right tone. The first part of that was more specific to Taylor, though the inability to hit the right tone applies to both. The Democrats were able to crawl to a disgusting new low last night. Some insane person in the Democratic Party thought it was a good idea to feature a young woman who lost her father to COVID-19 and have her turn the loss of her dad into an utterly revolting ploy to get you to vote for Joe Biden. To be clear, when people lose their dad, they grieve in all sorts of different ways. Some recoil into solitude, some change their lives, some act out in anger, and some turn their stories into cheap political advertisements. Happens all the time. So I'm not going to sit around here and judge a grieving daughter. I am going to judge the bottom-feeding Democratic Party who decided to exploit her loss like a shady trial lawyer. And by the way, all the trial lawyers are Democrats anyway, so it makes sense. They even ran one for vice president in 2004. Allow me to take you into this awful, exploitative underworld of the party of Saul Goodman, the Democratic Party of 2020. Hi, I'm Kristen Urquiza. I'm one of the many who has lost a loved one to COVID. My dad, Mark Anthony Urquiza, should be here today, but he isn't. He had faith in Donald Trump. He voted for him, listened to him, believed him and his mouthpieces when they said that coronavirus was under control and going to disappear, that it was okay to end social distancing rules before it was safe, and that if you had no underlying health conditions, you'd probably be fine. Okay, you get the the premise here. First of all, if you have no underlying health conditions and you get COVID, you will probably be fine. That doesn't mean you risk it. Doesn't mean it doesn't, bad things don't happen to anyone. It doesn't mean that COVID is not a big deal. It is a big deal. It is the worst global pandemic we have faced in a century. But odds are, if you're in good health, you'll probably get through it. That's true. It's important to note her dad was 65 years old. He wasn't an old guy, but he was getting up there a little bit in age. If you're north of 65 years old, you are in a vulnerable category, whether you have underlying conditions or not. 
And this ridiculous lie, this total scam that Democrats are trying to pull off here, that Donald Trump was the only one who said things on the record that underplayed this virus is ridiculous. The one comment from Trump that she specifically cites is this one. It's going to disappear one day. It's like a miracle. It will disappear. Okay, that happened on February 27th. Was Donald Trump saying things that were incorrect about the virus on February 27th? Yes, he sure was. So was literally every Democrat. This should not stop you from going about your life, should not stop you from going to Chinatown and going out to eat. I'm going to do that today myself. Come to Chinatown. Here we are. We're, again, careful, safe, and come join us. There is no concern at this time for coronavirus in our region. The Department of Sanitation is ready for Mardi Gras 2020. The facts are reassuring. I mean, that's from Tom Elliott at Grabian, and that's just a small slice of it. It's from all around the same period when Donald Trump said the virus will one day in the future disappear. In fact, the Nancy Pelosi clip recommending people go to Chinatown for a festival was almost on the exact same day as Trump's comments. Or how about the giant bag of awful who also spoke at the same convention on the same night as his grieving daughter, Andrew Cuomo? He said the reality was reassuring. He said that it wasn't as bad as the flu, that, quote, the facts do not justify the frenzy, period, that it was hysteria and unwarranted, that the fear was worse than the virus, and on and on and on. This stuff came weeks after the Trump comment, yet no word about that, despite the fact that seven times as many people died under Cuomo in New York than in Arizona. Andrew Cuomo is awful. Dot com. If you want to see a public official who was really getting his constitution uh, wrong and uh, really getting his predictions wrong and really getting his constituents killed in that era, go watch the series of shows we did on the Cuomo timeline. Okay, back to the story. How did all of this happen? So in late May, after the stay-at-home order was lifted in Arizona, my dad went to a karaoke bar with his friends. A few weeks later, he was put on a ventilator. I mean, look, this is a terrible story, and I can't blame a a grieving daughter for any of this. I blame the Democratic Party. But doesn't it seem a little odd to you that you would blame Donald Trump for this? It's not like Trump said to go out against the governor's orders. The governor lifted the stay-at-home order, not Trump. And in fact, while she would occasionally mention Trump, Trump in passing, her story of who was at fault for this was exclusively almost about Governor Ducey of Arizona. In fact, in the GoFundMe for her dad's funeral, the story was told this way. Kristen tried to convince Mark to shelter, to continue to shelter in place. Mark responded that the governor says it must be safe, so it must be safe. She then wrote a letter to the governor inviting him to the burial and not mentioning Trump at all. This is how the Washington Post covered the story at the time. Blood on his hands. In scathing obituary, woman blames governor for her father's COVID-19 death. Remember, this is after Trump publicly criticized the governor of Georgia for opening massage and tattoo parlors. I don't think Trump ever mentioned karaoke bars, but singing indoors is pretty well known to be a higher risk activity than getting a massage. It's not like she loved Donald Trump by any means. She did mention him occasionally as part of the problem, but it was much more about the governor and all of her writings. And all appearances are that the Democrats took her story made up of largely local criticism and remixed it into a national story to emphasize the anti-Trump elements. It's hard to overstate how gross this all is. And the anti-Trump messaging at the convention was, of course, explicit. And after five agonizing days, he died alone in the ICU with a nurse holding his hand. My dad was a healthy 65-year-old. His only pre-existing condition was trusting Donald Trump, and for that, he paid with his life. I can't get over how terrible this is. Here is a grieving daughter who is being exploited in front of a national audience and asked to retell her story in the most anti-Trump way possible to get some incoherent candidate elected. Donald Trump may not have caused the coronavirus, but his dishonesty and his irresponsible actions made it so much worse. 
a bit of positivity here. I'm glad the Democratic speechwriters allowed this part in. Hey, guys, they're allowing for the possibility that Donald Trump may not have caused the coronavirus. Hmm. Great to hear. One of the last things that my father said to me was that he felt betrayed by the likes of Donald Trump. And so when I cast my vote for Joe Biden, I will do it for my dad. Hmm. Look, dealing with something like this inside of your family is difficult enough. Trying to do it on a national stage is basically impossible. And the Democratic Party is absolutely grotesque for using her to try to get a few extra bucks from their donors. It really is a soul-crushing story. And it, as you've heard me ramble on and on and on, over and over and over again, you shouldn't blow this thing off. It is a serious threat and it's killed a lot of people. A lot of them tried to do everything they could to avoid it and still died. Some of them were Trump supporters and didn't take it seriously. You know that's true because you hear all of their stories in the media. From Herman Cain to a guy you never heard of at a karaoke bar, whenever the Democrats can use a dead body to grab a few votes, they are all in. And the media is there to cheer them on. As Beckett Adams outlined in the Washington Examiner, indeed, rather than leaving members of the national media feeling disturbed, the spectacle of a woman propping up her dead father for political purposes left journalists and commentators mesmerized, excited and deeply, deeply impressed. The New York Times chief White House correspondent Peter Baker, for example, called it the most damning line so far. Vox co-founder Ezra Klein said it was the most devastating line of the entire evening. Line? Politico magazine columnist Jeff Greenfield called it the most powerful presentation of the night. CNN politics uh, reporter Chris Saliza, meanwhile, said she had the most powerful moment. The list goes on and on and on and on. His daughter says that right before his death, he said that he felt, quote, betrayed by. Well, I should be cool. I should be uh, careful here. Not betrayed by Trump, Trump, betrayed by the likes of Trump. I'm not sure if he actually blamed Trump or if that's just another way this story has kind of been remixed for a national audience. Remember, this father, though, was a guy who died sadly, tragically. He was a guy who was a Trump supporter up until at least a couple of months ago. He believed Trump was the right guy to lead the country. That's not just for COVID. It's for a million other reasons, too. And now the story of his death is being exploited by this ghoulish Democratic Party who has forgotten already about him, about his daughter, and about their grief. This is such an incredibly nauseating spectacle. It really is hard to imagine how they will top it. But have faith, they surely will. If you're in the middle of looking for a home, maybe trying to sell your home, you're going to need a real estate agent you can trust. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go to find one. Why would you do that? Well, let's just say you're moving across the country. Maybe um, you, know, where there's, you have a job that's a, a promising thing across the country. You're going to go chase it. That's great. Where do you live? You're just going to trust some random real estate agent you look up on the Internet? Uh, that's not a great idea unless you're going to realestateagentsitrust.com. If you go to realestateagentsitrust.com, you're working with the best agents who will work with you, for you, to help sell your home or buy a new home. Uh, and that's important. You need someone on your side. This is the biggest financial transaction you'll probably ever have in your entire life. You need somebody you can trust. Realestateagentsitrust.com is basically like, you know, the Hall of Fame for real estate agents. They've gone through. They've sorted through all of them. Who's the best in the area? Uh, this person's great. This person's great. This person's great. You get one of those people, and then you're able to make sure that you have the best possible experience when you're going through one of these big financial transactions. Realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go. Learn more at realestateagentsitrust.com. One more time. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Happy to welcome back to the program Alex, Alex Epstein. He's the founder and uh, president of the Center for Industrial Progress and author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Great book. Alex, thanks so much for coming on the program. Hey, great to be back, Stu. So you got a new project going on right now, kind of as we're getting close to the election. You're trying to actually tell people the facts about energy and climate. Can you tell me about the project? 
Sure. So the project is just called energytalkingpoints.com. And if you want to know where to learn about it, you can guess it's energytalkingpoints.com. And the, the basic premise that led me to this is I saw a lot of candidates who were pro-freedom, but and and who would tend to be pro-freedom and energy, which includes we should be free to use fossil fuels, we should be free to use nuclear, we should be free to use hydro, which the modern green movement and unfortunately many Democrats uh, oppose. So they, they generally were inclined toward this, but they didn't really have the facts and arguments at their disposal. And I didn't really see anywhere they were going to get it. I mean, the oil industry might help them, but the oil industry is kind of in crisis. So I thought, okay, well, I have a lot of experience creating these points. So I'm just going to create tons and tons of talking points on every issue. And I'm going to make every single one the length of a tweet. So it's super easy to share. And I'm going to give like perfect bulletproof references for each one. So if you go to energytalkingpoints.com, it's just a totally free website. Right now, it's just a Google Drive folder. And pretty much any issue you're interested in from the Joe Biden energy plan to climate change to what energy policy should be positively, you'll see a lot of material uh, there. So I'm really hoping that candidates use it and also that citizens use it. It's going to be a great resource, uh, and I, I can't wait to check it out. I, we're just finding out about it, and I think it's a perfectly timed thing. We need it badly right now. Um, I want to go into the uh, Joe Biden energy plan uh, because sure. Biden has has had this. There's been this talk about how he's had this really rough road, and and no, you know, he's had this really tough uh, handling by the media and by the conservatives in particular. To me, like I don't think I've ever seen a Democratic candidate get a, a lighter touch. This has been all about Donald Trump and whether you like him or you don't. And like people have not investigated the policy platform of Biden really at all, especially since he's come out uh, and, and come into the general election. What is the Joe Biden climate policy? So I think that's one dynamic that's going on. But I think the other is that the whole idea of a Green New Deal basically got a free pass. So the essence mm. of a Green New Deal is you outlaw fossil fuels, outlaw nuclear, in some cases still oppose hydro, which most mainstream environmental groups do. And then you somehow power not only the electricity grid, but also heavy duty transportation with solar and wind via no known means. And as I've talked about on this show, solar and wind are unreliables. So you need some way of converting unreliable sun and wind into reliable electricity, let alone reliable energy for something like uh, transportation. And there's just no known way of doing this that's remotely cost effective, which is why no nation in the world is close to 100% solar or wind, even for electricity. And the more of this stuff you use, the more solar and wind you use, the more unreliable infrastructure you put on the grid, the more costly it is, because it doesn't really replace the reliable infrastructure, because you always need the coal plants and gas plants and nuclear plants there as backup 100% of the time. It just adds a lot of wasteful infrastructure. And that's why a place like Germany, that has only 33% of its electricity, something like 15% of its energy from solar and wind, it's got three times our electricity prices. And our electricity prices are way too high already because of solar and wind. They should have gone down because the price of coal has gone down and especially the price of gas has plummeted, yet electricity becomes more expensive because we keep adding this wasteful, unreliable infrastructure. The idea of a plan that mandates this global failure in an unprecedented way, that's just complete economic uh, suicide. And yet it didn't get questioned with the Green New Deal. So when Biden uh, advocated like a 20 percent more mild version, it seemed like, oh, he's pragmatic. He's mild versus <laughs> Venezuela will be rich compared to us if this thing gets passed. Yeah. You know, that, that's an interesting thing. I think people look at like Germany is a good example of this in that people look at it and they say, OK, uh, what's the harm? Right. What's the harm of putting a few solar panels up, uh, some wind energy? This is positive. And you might not be making a huge difference, but you're, at least you're making a difference. And I think one of the big keys to this, and I think Germany has had this issue, is you wind up locking in mediocre technology instead of waiting for these things to come around to a place where we all hope eventually it would be great if we can get cheaper energy some other way, whatever. I, however it's going to come reliably and cheaply, that's good for humans, and that's what we want. Um, but beyond that, like if you go and you spend a bunch of money on solar panels, you're not only going to get more expensive energy. When the better solar panels come along in five or ten years, you're already locked into this old technology. Is that the right way to think about this? 
Yeah, and, and it's unfortunately connected to many other bad things because we have all sorts of mandates. And, and one of the things on energytalkingpoints.com, I talk about the wind production tax credit, which is probably something that most people are not familiar with. But I would recommend reading that because you'll learn about this. Is a, it sounds innocuous, right? A wind production tax credit. But basically what it does is it forces grids to use wind whenever the wind is blowing and to either shut down or slow down the reliable sources like coal and gas and nuclear. And what happens then is it in effect bankrupts those plants. And so it drives reliable plants out of business and it has more and more unreliable plants. I live in California. Guess what's happening right now? A blackout. It's a green blackout though. Even Gavin Newsom admits that it's related to this mandating of what I call unreliables, uh, solar and wind. So that's just, there are all these incentives that are forcing us. It's not even just that they're equipped equating the price of an unreliable form of energy in a reliable form, they're actually incentivizing us uh, to use the reliable form. And keep in mind, all of this, none of this is anything like the Green New Deal, because in a place like Germany, what they're doing is they're adding costs dramatically. And that's really bad, because the cost of energy goes into the cost of everything. But that's different than mandating 100% renewable, which you have no idea how to do and would really bankrupt you if you tried it. You're in California, which is, you know, always the center of these environmental debates, it seems. Um, but you now have the vice presidential candidate, Kamala Harris, uh, who is going to step up and be uh, on the ticket for the Democrats. She had a pretty aggressive climate uh, policy of her own. Uh, you've been there. You've watched her in action. What, what do we need to know about her and her energy policy? Well, so she's definitely endorsed the Green New Deal. Uh, very interesting is that she's come out completely against fracking. And I, this is another thing at energytalkingpoints.com you can learn and, about and, and really share it with her. And so I shared these points with her. She hasn't responded yet. But the more people <laughs> share these points, uh, the better. And just, you know, one point that I talked about is you know, fracking is responsible for 60 percent of American oil and 75% of American natural gas. So if you outlawed that, that amount of oil coming off the market is the equivalent to the oil that came off the market in 1973 for the energy crisis. Wow. And like anyone who was around then or even knows about then, I mean, that was really a global catastrophe. And that doesn't even include natural gas. And so it's, it's just really staggering the extent to which people are not aware of how important energy is. Energy is the industry that powers every other industry. And they're not aware of where energy comes from. And fracking is where so much of energy comes from. Fracking is the only reason why the US is now the world leader in oil, the number one form of energy, the world leader in natural gas, the number three form of energy uh, in the world. This is so crucial. And this the degree of ignorance is shocking that somebody can just say, oh, I'll ban fracking. And people think, oh, that's good because there won't be pollution. That's like saying, oh, we ban antibiotics and there won't be antibiotic side effects. Yeah, but billions of people might die and you have to think of it the same way with energy. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, you know, fr fracking is a really odd one for environmentalists to oppose. If they actually care about emissions, fracking leads to a massive reduction in, in, in emissions because natural gas is so much lower as far as emissions go than coal. And it, yet the, the left continues to fight against that. Nuclear would be the ultimate here is zero right, emissions. Right, that's a more obvious example. Right? Yeah. Because it's zero emissions. Zero emissions, right, so and they fight against that too. What won't they fight against? We know that if we try to put up wind, uh, big wind farms, they'll fight against that for different reasons. Yes. Solar, they'll fight against that. What do they want? Do they want just civilization to go the opposite way, to, to no longer have progress that benefits humans? I don't understand what the, what the end goal is here. Well, every time I'm on your show, you ask one of these tremendous questions that almost <laughs> answers itself. Uh, but you left me a little room to explain. So I think that the examples you're drawing on are perfect because it's natural gas and you think, oh, that it might has half the emissions of coal. So maybe they'll support nuclear. But no, no nuclear, no hydro. And then you point out they also oppose wind when when they actually see that these have massive impacts. And so the key thing to understand about the modern environmental movement or environmentalist movement, which is a misnomer, is that it's actually the anti-human impact movement. So it's a, it's a movement that says it is wrong, morally wrong, for human beings to impact the rest of nature. And then as part of that, they have this idea that if we impact the rest of nature, nature is this delicate balance and it's all going to go to hell, et cetera. That's just complete pseudoscience. Usually the more Im we impact nature, 
when we do it intelligently, the better nature gets as a place for human beings to live. So it's really that it's this anti-human impact movement. And so when they see all these amazing technologies, including nuclear, which creates abundant electricity without CO2 emissions, all they can see is, oh, it's too much impact. In that case, it's, oh, it's wrong for us to split the atom. That's playing God. Or it's wrong for us to create nuclear waste, even though it's super easy to deal with safely. That's playing God. And they don't care at all about the fact that if we don't impact the world in this way with low cost, reliable energy, then billions of people can't survive. Today's whole standard of living, the planet isn't supposed to have 8 billion people on it. It can only have 8 billion people on it if we have a machine labor civilization. And that means power by machine food, which is energy. If you can't afford energy, then you can't afford to power machines. And then you cannot have a world of 8 billion people. And we don't want to be the ones to find that out in the US. So let's let some other country commit suicide and let's learn from it. Or why not learn from the fact that California, with just a mini, 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 mini Green New Deal, is having blackouts despite the fact that everybody knows how to produce electricity, and yet we somehow can't do it when it's hot. Mm, that's, a, that's a great point and a great way of looking at it. Uh, energytalkingpoints.com is the place where this, all this information lives. You get all of it in tweet length form, which is fantastic. What other topics do you have up there now? Uh, let's see. So Joe Biden energy plan, fracking, energy policy, climate change. Uh, there are a couple others. We're going to have one on reliable electricity soon because that's a very relevant thing. Uh, the California blackouts. And then also, if you're interested, people are interested. I post on Twitter at Al at Alex Epstein, so you can see those posts there. And if any candidates are watching this, or if you're connected to any candidates, feel free to just email me uh, individually at alex at alexepstein.com, and I will, as much as possible, try to help you out free of charge if you're actually advocating for freedom. Wow, there you go. I mean, free stuff for candidates. I mean, they, I, we know they like free stuff, so this is going to work out well. Alex Epstein, president and founder of Center for American Prog or Industrial Progress. And uh -huh. author, <laughs> yeah, wrong one. <laughs> That's definitely not the one you founded. Uh, <laughs> uh, and author of The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Thanks so much for coming on the program, Alex. I promise I won't confuse those groups ever again. Thank you, Stan. All right, back in a second. Chicago. Hell yeah, brother. Have you seen this video? <laughs> Bunch of We're people chilling. sitting. On a bridge. On a bridge. That's raised. That is raised in Chicago. <laughs> that is not safe. You know how I know? They're not wearing masks. Look at this. They apparently were crossing the bridge and it started rising up and they had nothing to do and now they're sitting on the edge that of it as it's straight really up in the air. Holy crap, that would be terrifying. They're a little too calm for that. I don't know what is going on. Uh, that is, uh, that's a terrifying clip. It kind of, it's a good microcosm kind of of, of what we're, of what we're facing, isn't it? Like, I, it's kind of how I feel every single day. We're right on the edge. Um, let me give you, um, especially in a world like this, where Andrew freaking Cuomo has a book deal, guys. He's got a book deal to write about how great he is. When we all know the truth. Andrew Cuomo is awful. Dot com. Chris Cuomo is worse. Dot com. Uh, he is getting a book deal to write a book about his experience leading New York State through the pandemic. Are they through the pandemic? I keep thinking this like one of these days, they're probably going to get a rise in cases like we're seeing now in Europe uh, is happening. We're seeing it. We saw it in Israel. Uh, it was happening. I mean, it happens. Uh, there's not much you can do about it exactly. But Cuomo has been such a, you know, he's been saying how great he is this entire time, despite having seven times as many deaths as Arizona. Um, I did want to remind you of this little bit of history, however, and it's an important piece of history. Last time Andrew Cuomo got a book deal, he got $738,000, a $738,000 advance. His book sold 3,200 copies. It means he got paid 231 bucks a book and then got another book deal. Will that happen to you? If you're if you got seven hundred thirty eight thousand for a book deal and it sold thirty two hundred copies, would you get another book deal? Probably not. Probably. Probably not. Uh, by the way, uh, another thing that probably wouldn't happen to you. Let's say you were getting massages from victims of sexual assault who happened to be imprisoned by a pedophile. And uh, his main way of getting them to do all sorts of gross sexual things was to start with massages. And then pictures came out in the Daily Mail that have you, you're right here, and you're getting a massage from this person right here, and this person 
is going to speak at the Democratic National Convention tonight. Would that happen to you? Would you get that sort of understanding from the media? I wonder. That's Bill Clinton right there. And then this is one of Jeffrey Epstein's victims. That's going on. So that'll, that'll, will that be mentioned at all tonight? I doubt it. I doubt it sincerely uh, by anyone in the mainstream media. Uh, Marianne Williamson has been watching the, uh, the convention. She's not happy about it. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, who's ugh, awful, uh, wrote, uh, watching the Dem convention, it's so good to see so many diverse people coming together to address racism and the promise of America. There is a sweetness and kindliness about this production. Uh, Marianne Williamson, in her tweet, uh, do we have that, responds, uh, no, I'm sorry, but they did not address racism. They showed a lot of beautiful pictures of POC and made references to BLM, but there was not one mention of an actual policy to help end systemic racism. It's like binge watching a Marriott commercial, (laughs) which is actually a pretty funny line. She was, it does remain the most entertaining candidate we've had uh, this year on the Democratic side. And I want to give you this too, Wuhan, Wuhan, everything's fine in Wuhan now. Wuhan has had a giant water park party for everyone to celebrate because they don't have any coronavirus now. Here's the, uh, here's the big pictures. I mean, look at this. It looks like a massive concert. Uh, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, no separation. No social distancing. No masks. Here they are in the water, which honestly is a little more gross than the, than the actual coronavirus. Can you imagine how much urine is on their bodies right now? That's a whole other story. Uh, they're all packed inside this tiny pool, and it looks really, really... I, I'm a claustrophobic even looking at it, but this is the thing you need to understand. There's an upside of having the ability to weld your citizens inside their homes. You get back to the water park much faster. That's the benefit of communism. Sure, yeah, there's a little struggle, and a bunch of people were probably murdered in the back of alleys. But back of the water park, you're on an inner tube in no time. Back in a second. She hosts uh, the news and why it matters. She hosts Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered on YouTube, which you should subscribe to right now. She also kicks the asses of young Swifties up and down Twitter. Of course, I'm talking about Sarah Gonzalez and her new hobby. Sarah, thanks for coming on the program. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I don't know why I love this so much. I don't know why either. (laughs) There's something about it I just love because here I am just innocently Mm-hmm. Looking at Twitter, and I see you make what I see what seems to be a generally positive comment about Taylor Swift that you like her music, but she's getting a little too political. Yes, right. Yes. This for this, all hell is unleashed on you. Is that right? Uh, yes. By what I like to call the Swifty cult, <laughs> because they are in fact a cult. Uh-huh. They are all that's wrong with society today. All that's wrong with <laughs> with young people wrapped into one little package. Mm-hmm. And it was not enough. It was not enough that I enjoyed the album. So you enjoy the album? Yes. And you just say that basically she's, what was the wording? It was basically that was, uh, she's getting a little too liberal for me or too, too outspoken. I mean, I may have used the word garbage. I don't okay. Know. <laughs> you know, that's, if we're getting that's technical. Right. To be technical, I did, you did call her a garbage. If we're getting being, technical. Okay. It was, it was a little more aggressive than I remembered. But you know, the response to it was details. The response way over to the it. top. Yes. And I will tell you, this is not my first run in with the Swifties <laughs> because when she called Donald Trump a white supremacist mm-hmm. on Twitter, I just, I felt like it was appropriate to just say, shut up, Taylor. Yeah, right. It's okay. just, just very, something very simple, mm-hmm. right? Uh, not too much nuance, because we know the left doesn't do well with nuance. No. So just, you know, shut up, Taylor. And I cannot even tell you how many people came out of the woodwork just at that as well. Uh, there are a lot of, of people who apparently have a, a fixation on whether or not you have a top lip. Yes. No, you're you're looking confused, but what I'm telling you is I really don't understand what you're saying. No, like that that's their that's their go-to argument is that you you're a white person who does not have a top lip. I, is that an ins I don't even yes. understand. That's an it's insult. It's supposed to be. Yes. Yes. I mean, we're so talking are, about a group of people who support Taylor Swift who is absolutely one half feline. There's <laughs> absolutely no question about it. Yes. And they're arguing about other people's white lips? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't is that, I really is is that an insult I should be familiar with, Sarah? I, no. Okay. I mean, okay. It, I don't know what it would say about you if you were already familiar with it. Right. Okay. But so they came after you. Yes. And what I found really interesting about this because you know people 
call us uh, Hitler every day. Yes. It's just part yeah. of our job. I, we get threats every day. Yeah. N- none of us, I mean, I, I know I don't care. No. You like to fight with these people I more than, I kind of ignore <laughs> them. You fight with them. It's very entertaining. Yeah. However, with the Swifties, I feel like there's an elevated level of anger. Like, even more than socialists and fascists and everyone else, people are burning down federal buildings, uh-huh. and you're going back at them pretty hard. You're going harder at the Swifties, and you're, I feel like you're dedicated to this. It's, it's, it's genuinely upsetting to me. <laughs> it's genuinely upsetting yeah. to me because I had no problem separating Taylor Swift's politics from her music and enjoying her music for what it was. Yeah. And they have made it so insufferable for me that I now cannot listen to her music. They've ruined Taylor they have Swift for ruined you. ruined Taylor Swift for me. It's so it's it's really interesting to see this happen because this has happened before. Uh, this Glenn has had run-ins with his favorite artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, the show has had been a, attacked and sued when we've put uh, you know talked about artists and put their music on the air. It, it's such a weird thing because I as a conservative really am able to make that separation almost all the time. Yes. We have to. We're forced to. You have to, to right? if you want to enjoy anything in life. Right, anything in life. You just say, oh, God, I don't care, whatever. They're an idiot. Just yeah. move on with their life. They won't allow that. They'd rather have less fans. They'd rather have people hate their music and them than to lower themselves to be enjoyed by a Trump supporter. It's very true, and it's so evident by all of her supporters. I mean, the nonsense that they come up with. And what's what's really fascinating and also scary at the same time is that they live in this weird world where you only matter based on how many followers you have okay. or how many likes you get. So the go-to response from them is just like, well, I mean, Taylor has more followers than you, so I think I'll listen to her. And it's like, <laughs> is this really uh, a, this is a thing. These are not high-level arguments. No, no. But, but it's so many of them. I mean, it, it. Well, they're children, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, how they many? They act like children. Yeah. That's all I can tell you. Are you arguing with twelve-year-olds on, on Twitter as well? Okay. So funny you should ask. Okay. I made I made the comment that these were children, mm-hmm. and that I wonder if their parents know what they're doing. <laughs> and there were far too many of them who were like, "Excuse me, I'm forty, <laughs> and I have a full-time job." And I'm like, "You're not making yourself look better." Right. This is not a good comeback. <laughs> oh. No. You know, I, I, the Taylor Swift thing I find to be genuinely like. Sad, because I, I was never a huge fan of her music. Not, That's not my, shocking. Yeah, I know. It's That's not. Really a, I'm not exactly in the target demo. <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, but you know, like I, you, you kind of like her story. Yes. And you know, she. I was. I was totally Team Taylor when Kanye West was going up and blowing up her moments. Me too. Like I think you know, like I. I, I don't. I don't have anything against Taylor Swift, and I feel like because she wasn't political and she was this big star. She was goaded by the media yes. over and over again to express how much she likes Democrats. Mm-hmm. And just and, and it, it kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And I noticed she never did anything when she was doing country music. But as soon as she got to pop, it was an OK area. And now she feels the need to be basically an, yet another Alyssa Milano, which we don't need. Right. Well, and that's the thing is that I can respect you as a celebrity. I don't need you to just shut up and dribble Mm -hmm. or shut up and sing. That's fine if you want to have a voice, you want to have a spot at the table, but be educated before you do it. Mm. That's the big thing is like she's she's trotting out USPS conspiracy theories, (laughs) you know, and it's like. You have an audience. Take it seriously. Don't just don't just trot out conspiracy theories that are unfounded and blast it to your fans who, you know, will eat it up. It's very irresponsible. Yeah, I I keep saying this and we've done it a million times on the show, but it's important. The order of events learn, (laughs) then protest. That is really hard for people to understand. It's two steps, though, so it's, it's really true. hard to... You can't do it the other way, though. You're not supposed to protest, then learn. It's got to be learn, then protest. Uh, it really is difficult for people to... You know, and I, I think this is a function of a really wrong-headed approach by the media. This goes back to, like, MTV rock the vote. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This idea that we should be excited when people go out and, you know, kids go out and they protest, right? They go out and they're trying to do something, even though, you know, of course they don't really understand, but they're trying to be active, and that's great. It's not no, it's great. Not. <laughs> You're creating little soldiers who will do protest things they don't even understand. Yes, yes. You don't want people involved who have no idea what they're doing. That's the last thing you want. This is what I feel. Yeah. It's like with the mail-in voting thing, right? Right. They're like, oh, well, we, 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 of course we have to mail ballots to everybody's house in California, or they won't vote. We have to encourage people to vote. If you won't 
take the step to to fill out an application for a, 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 an absentee ballot. So you don't even have to go to the polls. Mm -hmm. If you can't take that step, do we really want you voting? The answer is no. Have you put enough time into understanding who to vote for? No. To vote? No. No, right? No, absolutely not. I mean, I just <laughs> I keep coming to the same conclusion. I understand that everyone has the right to vote. Everyone has the right to, right. to eat dumb things. I got it. But shouldn't you try to do better? It, yeah, well, yes, because it is a right, but I mean, you gotta take it seriously. You gotta be responsible with it. Yeah. I, I see it more as a privilege. You gotta take it seriously. Yeah, you, and you should want to do it. Yeah. Because you know, I, I keep thinking that, you know, the Democrats want this universal mail in voting, but that's not the end of their game. They will try to expand that to state after state after state. Eventually, down the line, what they want is compulsory voting. Yes. So that you have to go to the polls, so that every idiot that hasn't yes. thought for ten seconds about this election will cast the vote, and they'll vote for the person who they've heard the best stuff about in the media. Right. Which, which is, of course, a Democrat. Exactly. Which is why, I mean, if I was a Democrat, I would love that method too, because yeah. I already know that I control the media, I control the narrative, I can trick all of these sheep into thinking exactly what I want them to think, and then they will press the right button at the voting booth. So, of course, they're going to want that. Yeah. And that is who we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Like, it is the people who follow Taylor Swift. Yes. Not the people who follow Rachel Maddow, who might be completely wrong, but at least have engaged their brain to try to understand these things and have just come down on the wrong side every time. But at least they're trying. Yeah. You know, people like the people that you've been <laughs> dealing with on Twitter. The, literally the dumbest people I've ever come into contact with. It does and seem I don't, that way. I don't mean that as like a, an insult. It's genuinely the truth. It's... <laughs> It's the, it's scary. Yeah. It makes me very fearful of uh, what kind of generation is being raised to become, you know, full time working members of society. And it makes you totally despondent about voting at all. Yeah. You realize your vote where you spend hundreds and thousands of hours thinking about what the right policy is, is canceled out by some Taylor Swift dolt. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean exactly. Taylor Swift. I mean, I don't even mean one of her supporters. I mean Just her. Taylor Swift Just herself. Taylor. <laughs> Taylor Swift. Don't let don't let the Swifties see this. I know. This They'll is why. I, this is why I don't tweet enough. I, <laughs> this is why I mute everyone who just bothers me. I just mute them and I never hear from them again. They don't come back to me over and over again like they do for you. That's a great point. But, but you, you guys, know I what? get so much entertainment out of your feed. Maybe I should do it more. Yeah. Well, you, or you could just pay attention to my feed, and I'll take the hits for you. How would people find your feed, Sarah Gonzalez? Uh, they can go to Twitter if they exist on that garbage website mm -hmm. and search for Sarah Gonzalez TX. Now, I, I'm not going to say that people should do this because this mm -hmm. would be wrong. Mm -hmm. But if you're watching the show and you, you're following Sarah, maybe just throw in some Taylor Swift stuff. See if she, she fires back at you. <laughs> you know, just just go to her a oh, little no. bit and just see what happens. I'm curious because I like seeing it. Oh, no. I think the American people would like to see it too. Sarah Gonzalez, host of the News and Why It Matters here on Blaze TV. I'm going to be on Friday with you, right? Yes. Yes, so go over there. Make sure you watch the News and Why It Matters. Watch it every night. But... Uh, uh, do that and subscribe to the YouTube uh, channel as well, Sarah Gonz Gonzalez Unfiltered on YouTube. And you can get all the shows right here on Blaze TV. Go to blazetv.com slash Stu. Use the promo code Stu because that's how they know you like this stupid show. And I can say stupid show with real confidence after an entire segment about Taylor Swifties. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely on the money. Plus, you'll save 10 bucks. Sarah, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. Back in a second. These iTunes reviews brought to you by NancyPelosiSucksPens.com. This one comes in, whatever. Lisa Page made me do it. That's the name of my wife on Instagram. You can follow her there. I've never seen or heard it, but Lisa said we had to rate it five stars. Something about how she buy, has to buy more purses. Uh, so I did. Five freaking stars. How about this one? It's great. Whatever. This is the best political comedy charts, graphs, statistics show hosted by a Canadian sports celebrity on the Internet. Five freaking stars. Thank you. It's great. Whatever. I was planning to give it four stars, but that's not the appropriate number of stars. Five freaking stars. Thank you very much. The next one. Uh, this stupid show. Smart, funny, sarcastic and smart. It's pretty great. Whatever. Five freaking stars. And, yep, five big ones. Five stars for the stupendous show. Love this show with the same intensity that I dislike the Cuomo brothers. Wow, that is powerful. Five freaking stars. Andrew Cuomo is awful.com. Chris Cuomo is worse.com. We'll see you tomorrow.